Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, with this video, we are concluding the course. Um, you might you might still have some things that you need to finish up, but uh, in terms of things that I wanted to share with you by way of these uh, video lectures, um, this was gonna try to just you know make a few concluding remarks um, by way of looking at some passages from a couple of really short works by Audre Lorde, um, and which I'll, I'll do in just one second. Um, I'll say up front that <clears throat> I hope what we did this semester was something that um, you found interesting um, and that you found helpful, uh, that perhaps if you had not been exposed to philosophy before, that you saw how um, rich and remarkable uh, it can be in terms of how it impacts the way that you see the world in yourself, um, that there's a variety of ways of doing it, and that uh, regardless of what you go on to do um, and who you're going on to be, that you can approach the world uh, more philosophically. You can ask questions that get to the heart of things or see things differently in a way that uh, perhaps most other people don't. Um, that you can perhaps uh, be more gracious, more understanding, more wise, um, that you can also be more demanding uh, in certain situations as well uh, in terms of integrity, what you expect of your society, what you expect of your political leaders, um, and of course a personal standard of excellence. Uh, perhaps you'll start to live a more intentional life that um, realizes its limitations and its possibilities in a way that, you know, before you started thinking about it, perhaps you, you didn't realize that. Um, and I, I really do hope these things. I know that this is uh, for, for most people to take this course. Uh, it is, it's, it's simply something that you saw meeting some sort of <laughs> requirement. Um, and, uh, but my hope is that beyond, beyond meeting that requirement, that uh, for those of you that were in a place in your life or wired in such a way or conditioned in such a way as to you were open to some possibilities of, of being surprised, um, I really do, I really do hope that you carry uh, some of what we did uh, away with you, you know, in the, in the months and years uh, to come. Um, don't just, don't just come to college uh, with the expectation of getting a degree and then getting a job and then moving on. I mean, you really should make the most of it. And uh, philosophy, um, along with, you know, perhaps classes and other disciplines, history, literature, art, um, these things can open your eyes to, uh, to a very different world. And, I, and I, think, I, think, I think a richer, potentially better world, um, even if you have to go through the process of, of the difficult and challenging process, of seeing some things perhaps in a way that you never saw them before. Um, so I, I hope that that happened and if it didn't, I'm sorry. Uh, it may be perhaps at least if it, that didn't happen for you, at least perhaps it wasn't too uh, irritating or boring. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, I wanna say that uh, the, the people and the text that we looked at this semester for the most part um, with the exception of they, uh, you know, we, we read uh, what what can be classified, uh, and perhaps <laughs> um, rightly so, is just a, a sort of Eurocentric, um, you know, old dead white dudes <laughs> that we read. Um, you know, I, I love what we read. Uh, I think that there's, there's uh, incredible ideas there, incredible philosophical approaches there. Um, that they're worthy of study, even for people who don't study uh, philosophy professionally. Um, but saying that, it's the 21st century, and we live uh, in a world that has um, a, div a diversity of people and views and approaches, and, and, we, didn't, and we didn't touch on those. Um, and in many ways, that does an injustice to what can be considered uh, philosophy and you know, helpful to us. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's not it's not really representative uh, of of everything that one can get into, and you know, and I'm sorry about that, but that's you know part of the constraints of you know teaching a course over a 
a short period of time and just wanting to expose uh, people to some of the you know, greatest hits, as it were. Um, so I, I say that to say, don't uh, if you if you were discouraged or dismayed because you didn't you didn't see anybody doing philosophy who looked like you or came from a similar background from you, um, that there are those people out there. And so one of the reasons that I wanted to um, end the course with uh, looking at a couple short pieces by Audre Lorde um, is she she shows us while she is not a philosopher. Um, I believe that her work is very thoughtful and contains a lot of philosophical implications. Um, and I think that it also made sense giving, given the amount of comments that I made throughout the semester about art and about poetry and about a different type of thinking and a different way of seeing. And, you know, ending with Heidegger and Heidegger's sort of response to the question concerning technology, to that the calculative sort of thinking and the world being turned into standing reserve and resources. And, you know, we're basically losing our humanity. Um, and that perhaps, you know, coming once again into a, a meaningful relationship by way of meaningful encounters and interpretations, and sort of attitudes and postures towards art, poetry, the beautiful, um, towards truth, that that really uh, opens up uh, someone like Audre Lorde to come in and make some remarks about, about poetry um, and how it, if it's not simply some sort of bourgeois activity that's merely expressing, you know, uh, feelings or, or, or just some abstract ideas. Um, and so that hopefully you can walk away not only with some really interesting ideas and historically important ideas and some some idea of what goes on in philosophy um, you know that has gone on in philosophy over the centuries that perhaps you'll also with this uh, with the with the arc of the course and how it developed also with um, Audre Lorde you can see how you can perhaps put some of this philosophy um, to use or at least or at least be inspired to try and put it to use <clears throat> so saying all that um, Audre Lorde is uh, a woman, uh, she's a person of color, uh, a lesbian, a poet, and a remarkable woman who you know, overcame many things in her life. And I feel that uh, her short writings um, really just get to the point and say some things that I think uh, can, can really can strike us um, in, a, in a provocative way. And I mean that in a good way, in a provocative way that uh, perhaps will shake us out of our apathy and, and reconsider what we're doing. Um, so I asked you to read uh, Poetry is Not a Luxury, which is just a few pages, as well as the transformation of silence and to language and action. And I'm, I'm not going to do like a, a full reading of this. I'm just going to you know pick a few things out to say. Um, and again, this is all all in route to sort of just concluding remarks and, you know, uh, uh, wishing you well on your way. So um, let's start with poetry is not a luxury. She opens it uh, with this. The quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives has direct bearing upon the product which we live and upon the changes which we hope to bring about through those lives. It is within this light that we form those ideas by which we pursue our magic and make it realized. This is poetry as illumination. For it is through poetry that we give name to those ideas which are, until the poem, nameless and formless, about to be birthed, but already felt. That distillation of experience from which true poetry springs, births thought as dream births concept, as feeling births idea, as knowledge births precedes understanding. Um, you know, she's here saying that there is, there is something within us that wants to come forth. And until we write the poem, or let's just say until we poetize, that is until we actually create, that it's just sort of there, uh, formless and nameless. And what she's advocating for is that we need to do this. And given, you know, what we've talked about already in, you know, in previous readings and uh, lectures, 
this isn't going to find an, an adequate, healthy, life-affirming, truly thoughtful, revolutionary. Uh, it's not going to find an outlet in the society in which we live, especially if we're living a life according to the status quo, according to the conventions of society. Poetry is a revolutionary activity in which we are delving deep into our own psyche, our own spiritual life, our own deep you know, yearnings for a life of purpose and meaning, a, a life that is contributing to society. And that's why she's, you know, it's in the title. Poetry is not a luxury. Uh, it's something that, that, that needs to happen. And to be clear, this doesn't mean that, that you have to write a poem. It doesn't mean that you have to like start painting paintings. That poetry can be much more, um, it, it, does mean the, it does mean those things. It does mean those sort of creative activities, but it also means something about the way that you're gonna live your life in a poetic fashion. Um, and that might be a little bit harder to get your head around, but I think once you start allowing for the possibility of creative approaches that are in tune with something within you that needs to come out and a truth that needs to be spoken, um, concerns that you have, um, then you might start to realize that there is a, a sort of necessity, um, that there is a sort of um, grace as well that comes about in attempting to live poetically. <clears throat> um, if we go over to the next page, on page 37, um, <clears throat> she says, uh, near the top, when we view living in the European mode <clears throat> only as a problem to be solved, we rely solely upon our ideas to make us free. Uh, for these we uh, for these were what the White Fathers told us were precious. So something like, and again, this is why I think it's relevant for what we did this semester. She doesn't want to view human life as just a collection of interesting ideas and that somehow by grabbing hold of an idea that we're saved. That, you know, there's, there's more to the situation that you're in than can be found merely in wrestling with an idea or finding an idea that someone said a long time ago that we have to still live our lives. We need something more. And especially for people that come from uh, minority groups, disenfranchised groups, right? Um, people who have not had the opportunities that other people have had that, uh, you know, have historically um, been the subjects of, of, of all sorts of oppression. Um, and she being a person of color, being a woman, uh, being a lesbian is someone being, you could even say maybe being a poet, um, you know, this allows her to really understand this uh, situation of, of, of oppression and disenfranchisement. And so it's not as though she can just sort of get some interesting thoughts in her head and somehow everything's okay. So a purely, a purely contemplative, a purely meditative approach um, is something that won't suffice. She goes on to say, but as we come more into touch with our own ancient non-European consciousness of living as a situation to be experienced and interacted with, we learn more and more to cherish our feelings. That's important. That's going back to Emerson, going back to Nietzsche. And to respect those hidden sources of our power from where true knowledge and therefore lasting action comes. I mean, you have intuitions, you learn not to trust them. And perhaps they've been so twisted by what's going on oftentimes uh, in the world in terms of what we uh, consume in our, with, with our imagination, our amusements, and you know, whatever passes for uh, our interests that uh, we don't even have instincts worth trusting anymore, perhaps. And so we really need to get back in touch with those and rehabilitate those. Um, and, and these things are coming out of our, of our total life situation. She says, at this point in time, I believe that women carry within ourselves the possibility for fusion of these uh, two approaches so necessary for survival and we come closest to this combination in our poetry and again you know like uh, a history of ideas and important and remarkable ideas but also this idea of having a situation in which you have intuition you have inclinations right because i speak here of poetry as a revelatory distillation of experience not the sterile word play that too often the White Fathers distorted the word poetry to mean in order to cover a desperate wish for imagination without insight. Um, for women, then, poetry is not a luxury. It's not just a chance to sort of say profound things that don't actually have any impact. 
that aren't connected to an actual personal biography. Poetry is meant to speak the truth of a lived experience and do it in a way that brings together those powerful and profound ideas. This is why poetry isn't a luxury. It is the combination of these things that are vital modes of let's call them salvation. Um, social, political, as well as in terms of those uh, spiritual, um, you know, inward aspects of our life. On page 38 in the middle, she says, the white fathers told us, I think therefore I am. That sounds familiar. The black mother within each of us, and that's the poet, she says, whispers in our dreams. So it's not some sort of rational argument. It's the, it's the smaller, subtler voice that speaks to um, primal inclinations, like a, 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 di a different type of wisdom. I feel, therefore I can be free, right? Note, note the differences here. I feel, therefore I can be free. Poetry coins the language to express and charter this revolutionary demand, the implementation of that freedom. I want to jump over to the transformation of silence into language. She says, at the start of this, I have come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be spoken, made verbal and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood. Um, she knows what it means to be silenced. She knows what it means. She had a, she had a, she had a she had a fight with cancer, and so she she saw like her faith, um, you know, her death come close, and and she sort of had to process all the things that all the times that she remained silent, didn't didn't say, didn't say what she was feeling, didn't say what it was that that she wanted to say, and she realizes that she can't she can't live that way, that no one should live that way. Um, she says down at the bottom of the page on 40, she says, but within those three weeks, I was forced to look upon myself and my living with a harsh and urgent clarity that has left me shaken, but much stronger. She says, this is a situation faced by many women, by some of you here today. Some of what I experienced during that time has helped elucidate for me much of what I feel concerning the transformation of silence into language and action. In becoming forcibly and essentially aware of my mortality and of what I wished and wanted for my life, however short it might be, priorities and omissions became strongly etched in a merciless light, and what I most regretted were my silences of what I had <laughs> ever been afraid. Um, you know, many of you are young and you got a lot of life ahead of you. Um, and as such, between that and between the way that society uh, oftentimes conditions us, you know, um, we don't, we don't, you don't, we don't say uh, much of what it is that we probably should say. Um, and this doesn't mean like these proclamations of, 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 of judgment and outrage, although it could mean those as, as well, for sure. But that the truth of a lived experience of the things, you know, by, by which we suffer, um, by which, you know, we experience joy, um, our fears, whatever it might be, that these things don't have to sort of be repressed, like internalized and just uh, repressed, that these things can find outlet by way of art, by way of a poetic approach to thought, spoken and acted, um, that we can take these inclinations that are these really deep, uh, you know, level of processing of what's going on around us and in our situation, in our life. And then we can, we can speak the truth. We can make something of it. We can not regret what it is that happens to us, that we can, that we can move forward in a, in a, in a, in a, in a positive way, in a, in a way that is giving meaning to our lives. And, and I would argue that philosophy uh, is so important to this task or to things that, you know, skirt along the edges of philosophy. And, I, and I'm one of those people that think that poetry and philosophy um, go hand in hand. Um, she says on the last page of it, um, <laughs> and this is about uh, 
you know, reading things and teaching things uh, that deal with uh, with uh, black women and uh, you know, basically people from from very different non-European, non-white background. She says, yet how many years have you spent teaching Plato and Shakespeare and Proust? Or another, she's a white woman and what could she possibly have to say to me? Or she's a lesbian, what could my husband say or my chairman? Or again, this woman writes of her sons and I have no children. And all the other endless ways in which we rob ourselves of ourselves and each other. We can learn to work and speak when we are afraid in the same way we have learned to work and speak when we're tired. For we have been socialized to respect fear more than our own needs for language and definition. And while we wait in silence for that final luxury of fearlessness, the weight of that silence will choke us. But that time that we're waiting for, in which we feel differently, or it seems a better time, she's saying, if you wait for that, it won't come. They'll just choke in the process. But these things, these things require a recognition of the moment a recognition that in each and every moment, perhaps, one needs to, with courage, speak the truth of their convictions, the truth of their experience. And she says, the fact that we are here and that I speak these words is an attempt to break that silence and bridge some of those differences between us. For it is not difference which immobilizes us, but silence. And there are so many silences to be broken. I would really like for you to think about that, you know, as you perhaps reflect on this course and, and what direction you can take it. Um, you've got a lot of opportunities ahead to grow and to become an interesting person and a person of conviction. And you can do that or you can choose not to. That's kind of really what it comes down to. And I so very much hope that you choose to be um, the best version of yourself that has a life filled with possibilities of meaning and expression and, you know, also that's wise. <laughs> uh, I think that's where philosophy can come in because it can help clarify some things that you might be confused about or wrestling with. Um, and it can just give you some tools perhaps to make better sense of this life. And don't worry if you don't figure it all out, if you don't get the philosophy. I don't know that there is a, you know, the philosophy that there are a variety of approaches, a variety of methods and areas of philosophy that I think all of them, whatever it is that interests you, can illuminate that, that area of your life, that that method can you know, speak to some way of refining um, dimensions of your life that sometimes you weren't even aware were dimensions of your life. It can unlock a lot of stuff. And so I hope that you undertake that journey. Um, I wish you the best of luck in your examinations and um, your writings and in your future studies. Um, just uh, you know, keep reading and keep thinking and dear God, keep reading. <laughs> I'll see you later.